Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, closing plenary session of this year's uh, ADP Network meeting. Thanks for uh, joining us in what will be uh, a very important conversation on a very important topic, I think, that will uh, influence your work in the years ahead. Uh, let me introduce the panelists. I'm going to be moderating, but mostly you're going to hear from our invited guests who are seated beside me. First of all, Carmel Martin. We're really thrilled you could join us. She is the Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, as you know, we heard from the Secretary uh, a little bit earlier today, and it was a, a fabulous message that he delivered to all of us. So we're eager to have you here to help uh, look at ESEA with us. Uh, Carmel, before coming to the U.S. Department of Education, for those of you who don't know, was general counsel and chief education advisor to the late Senator Edward Kennedy and worked with him on uh, the Senate Health Committee. And before that, it had other important roles there helping to staff uh, the, committee on the committees on the Hill. So she's got a lot of experience um, previously and certainly in her current role leading the development of federal education policy, in particular uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Further down, I think everyone here knows Katie Haycock, a very close friend and partner of Achieve. Um, she probably doesn't require much of an introduction, but uh, she has been the president of the Education Trust since she helped establish it in 1992, and prior to that was doing very important advocacy work nationally and in the state of California, always with one goal, which is what's in the best interest of children in this country, and particularly looking at all children, particularly children who are traditionally underserved. Uh, she's been a huge ally for all of us, and I know all of you who have been working seriously for reform, and uh, we're really eager to hear what she has to say about where uh, federal policy should be going to support your work. Next to Katie, Paul Pastorek, who I think all of you know, state superintendent in Louisiana, also a very good friend of all of ours uh, who are working on reforms. Uh, Paul has done very impressive things in the years that he's been state superintendent, uh, which I believe is since uh, 2007. Is that right, Paul? Um, and really in that relatively short period of time, I think all of us would agree Louisiana has been a leading state in education reform, broadly speaking, but also very much on um, the set of issues that you all here in the ADP network are talking about. Um, and I can tell you that um, we believe he's among the most visionary and courageous leaders in the country. Um, and I know we'll continue. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and he's the smartest guy in the world and uh, could rewrite the law by himself. Um, no, in all honesty, that uh, we know he'll continue that good work and we know mm -hmm. that um, whatever. Uh, Federal incentives he has had or will have, uh, whether he has them or not, he will continue and get the work done. So we appreciate that he was willing to join us here today. And last but not least, Mike Casserly. That's right. In, down at the end. In contrast. I, in <laughs> contrast. <laughs> yeah. um, Mike is also a close friend of all of ours and has been uh, working on many of these reforms for many, many years, and I know has been a big supporter recently of the work on Common Core, and I'm sure he'll talk about that. Uh, he is the executive director of the Council of Great City Schools, and for those of you who know the council, they represent um, the largest urban districts in the nation. Um, so Andres Alonzo and many others who, rep who work in, in LEAD, the largest school districts in the country, are represented by the council, and um, Mike has ably led that organization for many years. Um, and as I said earlier, he's been very much behind all of the reforms that you have been talking about, so we're eager to hear what he has to say. And this will, this will be much like the other sessions, even though they're not in comfy chairs. Um, we're mostly going to hear from them and have a bit of a dialogue and then open it up to the room. And the gist here, I think, is even though ESEA reauthorization may not be moving ra as rapidly as it could have been, there are a lot of conversations that have been going on. Um, the Secretary uh, put out a blueprint, I think, over the winter, if I remember correctly, March, March um, which we'll hear St. Patrick's Day, day before my birthday, <laughs> um, and uh, with a vision, and a vision that I think you'll find consistent with many of the reforms that we've also been incentivizing through uh, Race to the Top, and a vision that has college and career readiness 
as a very important part. Um, and since then, a lot of work and conversations have been going on, and um, uh, Carmel and others may uh, hypothesize about the timing of when things will actually occur. But one thing's for sure, whenever these issues are resolved, um, that law will really either continue to help spur the kinds of reforms you have been talking about over the last two days and working so hard on, or potentially make that harder. So all of us want to make sure it's the former and not the latter, and there's some very challenging, complex issues involved and some great opportunities. And that's what we're hoping to focus on as much as possible, mm -hmm. focusing on the issues that you've been working on around the college and career ready policy agenda. Common core standards, higher standards, new assessment systems, shared assessment systems that may not be ready for several years, um, higher standards on those assessments, uh, which may end up meaning fewer kids are, are scoring college ready at the beginning. What do we do about that? supports and interventions, uh, accountability metrics that value college and career readiness, particularly around high school. A lot of the things you've been wrestling with in your states, um, we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon and hear what folks have to say. So really important that this dialogue start, that you get and continue to stay actively involved in it as things shape up in Washington, um, because this will be an influencer in the years ahead, has been an influencer in the past years. I think no one would dispute the power of what NCLB has done uh, in our schools. People may have concerns about some of it, but standards for all kids, common standards, disaggregation of data, um, serious looking at the low performers, both the students in the schools and not hiding from that, those are hallmarks of the law leading into the point we are now. So for me, at least, the, the challenge and opportunity is how do you preserve what's worked, um, but how do you move it forward toward a new vision that honors all the things that you all have been working on and talking about so that um, the law is very supportive and encouraging of the, of the states that are moving the furthest and the fastest. So with that brief intro, I'm going to turn it over to Carmel and um, ask you to give your opening thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I want to thank ACHIEVE and the American Diploma Project for bringing us all together and allowing both Arnie and I to speak with you today. Uh, unfortunately, unlike him, I don't have a big chunk of money to give out in my <laughs> presentation, which is just not fair. But um, I'm thrilled to be here and want to congratulate ACHIEVE and um, all of the people participating in our assessment competition for um, the, their success with that competition. Um, that, that program is uh, driven, like the rest of our policy agenda with respect to education, is driven by the President's overarching goal that we get to be first in the world uh, once again in terms of college completion. And um, the thing that's a uh, positive part of that driving our agenda, I think, is it forces us to think comprehensively about education, helps us to think across the continuum of education programs, so not just looking at K-12 and focusing on K-12, but also thinking about early learning and post-secondary success and how we can make sure that each of those components are aligned and supportive of each other. Um, as you all know, we can't get to the President's goal with respect to college completion um, if we don't do a better job in terms of ensuring that more students are graduating from our high schools, college and career ready. And I certainly don't need to tell this group that that's not going to be possible if our standards are not aligned to that goal. Um, so that's why it's been such an important priority for the President and for the Secretary in our work with respect to the ARA funding streams, Race to the Top, the assessment funding stream. Um, and it certainly will be a critical component of our work with respect to re the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Hopefully that comes out very strongly in the blueprint that we released in March. Um, the Secretary says often that he feels like one of the biggest problems with current law is that it creates incentives for states to lower standards and what we really want to do is flip that and use the programs and the federal investments in ESEA to actually create pulls and incentives to raise standards and ensure that we are the entire system is aligned around the idea of being uh, career and college ready. Um, more broadly, just take a moment to talk about our overarching goals for the reauthorization. Uh, we, we certainly see the promotion of college and career ready standards as a critical component to the work in the reauthorization. 
uh, but I'd say more, more bro broadly, we're really trying to um, push forward with a new vision for the federal role in education. One thing that we don't want to change, but rather to enhance, is the, the federal focus on achieving equity. So all of our policies we're trying to approach from the lens of equity. How can we help, how can federal funding streams help to support more equitable educational opportunities for all kids? So that's something we don't want to change, but some of the ways we would like the law to support a different vision for federal involvement include, I guess first and foremost, creating a culture of continuous improvement in the education system. Um, we think there's some components of current law that discourages that rather than encouraging it. And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about how our new accountability framework we think will help drive that. The second is to move away from the focus, sole focus on a compliance mentality at the federal level. We're trying to do that right now in terms of how we're approaching the Recovery Act funding streams and impl the current implementation of programs, but really do want to think more deeply about how federal programs can be structured in a way to let us set high standards, set high goals, um, but, but not micromanage how the work is done at the state and local level. So that's something that has driven a lot of our work with respect to the blueprint. And then the third area that we are really focused on is how can the federal government better build capacity both at the state and the local level to support, again, that, that that system of, of continuous improvement, but also that drive towards innovation <coughs> and success. So um, those are sort of our broad uh, objectives for the reauthorization, specifically with respect to getting, supporting the continued movement towards college and career ready standards that, that we hope we have helped to, to, um, to jumpstart through the assessment competition and by supporting the state-led effort around the Common Core. Um, in, with respect to reauthorization, some of the things that we're thinking about is something I, I know you're all well aware of, is you can have the best standards in the world, but if we don't translate those standards into practice, then they're not very meaningful. So as we approach the reauthorization, we thought about what were the building blocks to get from college and career ready standards to uh, better teaching and learning. And we think that the core components or building blocks to get there include um, high quality assessments, which we've made some progress on in, in the context of the competition, but we want to carry that through in the assessment funding streams that exist in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, but also by having a fair but rigorous accountability system that again incentivizes high standards as opposed to creating incentives for lower standards. Um, but also important building blocks are to take that, those standards through high quality professional development systems, human capital systems, and effective instructional supports and translate them in that way. So we're trying to tackle each of those pieces in our blueprint and hope, look forward to working closely with Congress to execute on that plan. Um, briefly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the accountability framework that we've put forth. Um, again, our, our overarching goal is to ensure that we keep a strong focus on closing achievement gaps and equity, but at the same time, how can we get the system to be one where we're really focused on a culture where everybody's constantly using data to get better? Um, the Secretary feels pretty strongly that, that some of the key components to doing that um, include having a much more rigorous um, re system of rewards for success, a focus on growth and progress, so we're really building that into every piece of our proposal, um, while continuing to have performance tar targets based on an overarching goal of getting all students co to graduate high school, college, and career ready, um, rather than the performance targets we currently have, which are not really framed in most states around that overarching goal. Um, also want to allow for greater flexibility in terms of how states get to those goals. We think one of the ways to provide that flexibility is to make the, inter the intervention system in the chronically underperforming schools much more real and um, frankly more dramatic uh, so that we can create by having a real system of rewards for progress and success, a real system of intervention when, when people 
fail to, make, to show any progress, that we can have more pushes and pulls for the schools, um, the rest of the schools, while still requiring that they set performance targets, set, develop plans to meet those performance targets, and keep a, a very um, close uh, focus on closing achievement gaps. Um, I think the other big uh, focus in terms of our accountability proposal is the concept of shared responsibility. Um, the secretary feels pretty strongly that under current law, the, the focus really was at the school level, which was appropriate because that is where the students are, but we're, um, we need to make sure that it's not just all on the backs of the teachers and the principal in that school in terms of uh, improvement efforts. So we tried to build into our proposal a system of rewards and interventions at the district and the state level as well as the school level and built in uh, additional federal support for building capacity at the, at the district and the state level so we can create the system of continuous improvement not just at the school level but at each level of the system. Um, another big part of our focus for the blueprint is a focus on teachers and leaders. Again, that's part of building a professional development system that can help execute against college and career ready standards. We think to be able to deliver on that new improved professional development system, we do have to make some pretty fundamental change uh, with respect to how schools are organized and how the profession's organized. Some of the building blocks to get at that new vision for teachers and, and leaders and other educators in schools include uh, a focus on improving the teacher preparation programs that we have in this country. And I think we, we feel pretty strongly that we're agnostic about whether those teacher preparation programs are through alternative certification mechanisms or traditional um, teacher preparation programs. We support both, we just want them to be effective. So that's really our focus in that context and responsive to the needs of the elementary and secondary education system, which is not always the case in the current context. We also think part of the building blocks there are to create instructional teams in schools, which requires giving people time to collaborate, data that they need to help them to help each other to improve, um, but also a system that recognizes um, the best and the brightest in our schools so that they can serve as resources to their peers, uh, as master teachers, instructional leaders, um, we, you know, we could, to, to get to our goal of having every student have access to a highly effective teacher, we, we can't just look at pipeline. We have to do a better job of providing mechanisms for improving the people who are currently in the building. Um, and we also feel strongly that there should be a system of recognition and rewards for teachers, not just for schools, that make ex exceptional prog progress. And then the, the third area I just wanted to mention um, is, the support for building curriculum and instructional materials aligned to college and career ready standards. Um, we have approximately a billion dollars in our 11 budget aligned with our reauthorization proposal that is designed to put in place high quality state developed, locally developed curriculum and instructional supports. We have two overarching goals for those programs. One is that where appropriate they would be aligned to college and career ready standards. And the second is that there'd be a focus on developing um, a well-rounded education program as opposed to um, a narrowing into just two subject areas. So we have robust funding beyond English language arts and the STEM field. <coughs> um, so we think in, so in um, all of these pieces are necessary to get us from our overarching goal, which I know is a shared goal here of translating those standards into practice, we think it'll be extremely difficult, if not possible, to get there if we don't reauthorize the law because we do think there's some things in current law that will serve as barriers to that, that, that overarching goal. So we're very eager to see the reauthorization move forward. We've been really pleased at the level of bipartisan support for moving forward. Both committees of jurisdiction are actively um, developing bills and they're doing so on a bipartisan basis and they've been working closely with us as they move forward with their work which we're thrilled about and eager to continue to see that um, move forward. So with that I will um, pause and turn it over to Katie. I did have a PowerPoint but since Katie was here <laughs> I just felt too inadequate. So. <laughs>
<laughs> and Katie doesn't have a PowerPoint, you'll, you'll all be delighted to know. Um, so uh, Matt asked me to do sort of two things during my uh, six or seven minutes. Um, and I'm going to try to do that first, uh, to say a little bit about what we think with NCLB, so what helped and what hurt. Um, second, uh, to, to give you at least some um, thoughts about the next round. So what are the things that we ought to be thinking about as we move into reauthorization um, with a specific focus on uh, college and career readiness? And you'll, you'll hear some parallels with what Carmel said and, and uh, some things um, that are a little different. So on the what helped, I suspect there's there's already agreement in this room about what helped. The attention to groups helped, the focus on results helped, better information out in public helped. Um, and I suspect you would actually also be forced to admit what some um, observers have suggested, and that is that the very rigidity of the law that you all hated actually was what created fertile ground for the common standards and assessments that you all love. So um, you actually might have to put the rigidity of the law in the thing that helped. Um, in terms of what caused problems, we all know those two, uneven standards, undifferentiated accountability, as I think it was Mike Cohn who said in one of the meetings we had thinking about um, reauthorization that when you have a system that labels all or most of your schools as failures, there's a real strong disincentive to acknowledge that some actually are. Uh, and we need a system next, next go round that does just that. Um, but also, the current law has consequences that were too rigid, um, and in some cases, I think we'd all admit just plain stupid. Um, the final part, I think, of the problem was a perception, um, a widespread perception, especially among teachers, that the law was all hammer and no help. So given that, what are the things we have to think about as we head into reauthorization with college and career readiness in mind? Um, a couple of thoughts. First, though it is always tempting, especially in rooms like this one, um, to jump immediately to a very interesting, exciting conversation about how to set goals um, and otherwise do accountability with the new common standards and assessments in mind. The reality is that those are not going to come online in time to serve as the accountability framework um, in reauthorization. We've got a couple of years without the new assessments. In other words, what we have to do is come up with a framework for accountability that will actually allow for a transition um, for, from the first few years with current standards and assessments, uh, or at least current assessments, to the new one. And those of us who have sat in rooms and tried to figure this out, and many of you have been in those rooms, know that it just hurts your head to try to figure out how you create um, a, a framework for accountability that has, in its first couple of years, these very uneven, and in many cases, way too low level uh, assessments, and then transitions to this tougher one. So we have to figure out how to do that. Second, it may also be tempting, uh, particularly in this room, to think that the time for a sort of sharp-edged federal accountability um, has passed us by, um, that just as states um, have provided the leadership for a new generation of standards and assessments, that states can provide the leadership on accountability as well. There's two problems with that. First, when you talk honestly and privately with most of the chief state school officers who have really um, been working on change, most of them say that they really need the pressure um, of a federal accountability system to move things further and faster in their states. That, in other words, without that federal leverage, the politics of getting change and the politics in particular of an equitable change are just too tough. The second reason, though, uh, or barrier that stands in the way to states uh, taking the full lead on this is that the past record is not good. In the past, both in uh, NCLB and in its predecessor, IASA, when the, when issues were left to states to define uh, what's adequate in terms of goals or definitions, things like what's a, de what's a goal for high school graduation rates, things like what's a requirement for being a highly qualified teacher, things like what progress should be considered adequate in IASA, most states didn't step up to that 
um, to that challenge. In fact, the typical definition of adequate progress was not falling backward very far. So both of those things stand in the way of you doing what you want to do, and that is accountability by yourself. Third, does that mean, though, that we have to have an accountability system that's as rigid as NCLB? I certainly would argue that no, it doesn't. But it does mean, I think, that we need really clear federal principles within which states then can design and propose their own approaches to accountability. Now, I'm not sure exactly what those principles should be, but, but I, I'm inclined to think, or we're inclined to think, that there, there are several um, uh, good ideas for start. For, for one thing, we think it would be very good to, avoiding, to avoid setting goals for years well beyond the authorization period. The nice thing about that is that avoids us having an insane conversation about 100%, you really mean 100%, if you, if you don't set goals um, for 20 years from now, you actually don't have to have that conversation yet. And I would argue this is not the time to have a 100% college ready conversation. Number two, progress goals, I think we all think, need to be set so that they stretch but don't break. Um, and that means setting them with an eye toward what the data tell us um, about what kind of progress is made in our um, top gaining schools. What might principles like that look like? Um, perhaps something like this, that over the next 10 years, um, states would, would be charged with designing an accountability system that seeks to increase by 50% the number of kids that are college ready while simultaneously cutting the gaps by 50% in that same time period. Again, I'm not sure that's the right number, and we would want principles that are, that are grounded in real data, but something that, that um, <coughs> stretched but not broke like that, I think could, um, could work. And that means um, both stretch overall goals and stretch gap closing goals for all schools, not for just some. Um, third, I think it's pretty clear that we need to avoid this if all schools are labeled as failing, nobody really calls any failing or does anything about it um, situation. We need, in other words, different consequences and probably different labels for different kinds of problems in our schools. And states really need to be partners with the federal government in thinking, thinking hard about what that looks like. Um, and that includes the rewards that Carmel talked about. Number four, as everybody in this room knows, we. We, we dramatically need to rethink our approach to high school accountability. That if we're gonna actually mobilize um, our high schools in pursuit of getting their kids college ready, that means we can't just rely on assessment results in two subjects, English language arts and math, and grad rates. It's too hard to mobilize a full school staff if you do that. So we need to think about um, a combination of measures at the high school level, course completions, and of course exams and other subjects, promotion and credit accumulation rates, college going rates, and so on, that would actually provide a fuller picture of what's happening in a high school as regards college readiness. Um, final point on, on this kind of set of principles is none of this is gonna work, and Carmel said this as well, if we don't do a better job this time of figuring out the district role, especially vis-a-vis low-performing schools. Clearly, leaving first responsibility for low-performing schools just to districts had at best uneven results. Some districts did, in fact, mobilize real change in their low-performing schools, and some did not. And that's what happened when our standards were relatively low. There's no reason to believe that if we don't figure out the district role in this um, and we don't create the partnership that Carmel talked about, that it's going to be any, any better this time. One final thought, um, and this will also pick up something that Carmel men mentioned, something that um, I gather was discussed yesterday, and that is the real importance of curricular supports for teachers this, this time around. Um, it's very clear to me as I spend time with teachers around the country that um, they really do feel like they're teaching in the dark. And this idea that NCLB for them felt like all hammer and no help is really about, um, at least in part, never having the materials they needed, the lessons, units, assignments they need, and having to go home at night and make it up and not having the resources to do that and do that well. Um, if we're going to get more success this time, and I think all you know this, we can't just leave the curriculum function to local districts, local schools, individual teachers. You know, Matt told me yesterday about your little clicker exercise and you're most worried about 
Um, whether your teachers are really on board, they're not going to be on board if they have to make all this up for themselves. So we've got to find a way collectively to provide better resources so our teachers are not teaching to these standards in the dark as well. Thank you. Terrific. Paul? Hard to follow Katie. Right. Hard not to precede me. Katie, yeah. right? Carmen? Yeah. <laughs> I'll follow you anywhere. But it's <laughs> I appreciate that. You know that. I, uh, I, I want to start by saying that, uh, that I have been very impressed with the blueprint as an outline for where we're going. And I think overall it hits a lot of very important and positive uh, points. I, I think from the state perspective, probably the most important point is we're moving toward differentiated accountability and growth as a measure for uh, a determination of the success or not of a, of a school. <coughs> and uh, I think we all recognize in the field that if we're not looking at growth as a major element of our accountability system, then we are going to make fee people feel like they're, they're left out. Now, I also want to say that the department has done a very good job of getting input from us and others in the preparation of the blueprint. And that's very important. Um, now, having said that, I, I, I was waiting for the but. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no <laughs> but. Uh, having said that, having said that uh, I think there are there, there is a, an important question of what is the federal role. Uh, and, and I think that we should be guided by an answer to that question in making decisions about what is and is not in the blueprint. Um, I think that the president has outlined the federal role here. And it's very well stated in the blueprint. We want all students to be college and career ready. We want all students to be able to to, or not to be able, but to actually go to at least one year post-secondary education. Now, if, if that is indeed the federal role, then what is in the blueprint and how we change No Child Left Behind or Elementary and Secondary Education Act and, and reauthorize it is then guided and, and is then directed. And I think that the, the real hard question is what are the things that are necessary to achieve college and career readiness if that is in fact a federal responsibility and goal. And I would argue it is, absolutely unequivocally. It is essential to the country to have our kids college and career ready. That's a national requirement. It's a national security requirement, national economic requirement. And if it is, then we need to do everything we can to reach that objective. Uh, and we need, to, we need to, of course, learn from NCLB, which has its flaws, no doubt about it. But let me, th let me throw some questions out there or some concerns uh, that we need to look to. In NCLB, we said every child had to be proficient by 20, uh, 2014. In the blueprint, we're saying every child needs to be college and career ready by 2020. Now, in NCLB, there was a huge consequence for that. In the blueprint, I don't see where there's a consequence for that. So the question I have is, are we going from one end of the pendulum to the other here? And if there is no consequence, or if there's no palpable consequence, are we really going to get to college and career readiness? Now, I, I understand that it's, it's hard to say we're going to get 100% by 2020 uh, uh, because it's nigh on impossible to imagine that. And yet, the urgency of now is real. Uh, you know, this is not about next generation. This is about this generation, and we have to be focused on it. So I admire the goal, but I wonder how we're going to assure that everybody meets that goal. Now, let me, let me take on a, a, an idea that, that, that Katie threw out here. Everybody needs a bad guy to blame it on so that they can get the work done. Boy, I know that's the case in Louisiana. Everybody needs a bad guy. 
Now that's a practical reason to do this, but it's probably not the right reason to do it. <laughs> but the right reason to do it is because every child needs to be, every student needs to be college and career ready. So what are the necessary accountability measures that need to be in place? I had a discussion before I took this job with Michael Fullen, who I have great admiration for, and I read a book because of a friend of mine who's here today who told me how to read this book, and it was most illuminating. It says, he says, that accountability is a necessary prerequisite to improving schools. However, it is not the only requirement. You must have capacity building coupled with accountability in order to be successful. Now what is also really important about this blueprint is that it focuses on capacity building. Now the, the hope I have is that we not forget that accountability must be married to capacity building in order to be successful. So let me go to one area that I do have some concern about and that is that we're we have consequences in the blueprint, as I understand it, for the bottom 10% and, and positive rewards for the top 5%. And we have reporting for the intermediate schools, but there are no consequences for the intermediate schools. Now, I'm not begging the federal department to impose on us prescriptive consequences for those 85, but I think there must be consequences because accountability is a combination of reporting and consequences, whether favorable or not. And, and this is not accountability for the 85% if it's merely reporting. Now I also understand that the, that the policy, uh, as I understand it for, in our, my discussions, we've got to focus, and I'm all for focusing, and we've got to focus our resources and attention to the bottom 10%. But in my state, it's not 10% that are abysmal uh, uh, failures uh, to children. It's a lot larger than that. You know, the way I try to measure failure in our schools so that people can, real people can understand it, as I say, how many kids are not performing at grade level in our schools? How many? And I can look in Louisiana and I can tell you that there are more than 20% of our schools that are failing at least 50% of the kids. Now that's a huge number, and the numbers don't get much better if I go up to 30%, 40%, 50% of schools, I'm still failing 30, 40% of kids. That's a huge number. So if the urgency of now is to get all of those failing schools fixed, then we've really got to decide, what is a failing school? Now, I, I, Louisiana did, by the way, exactly the same thing that's being done, being proposed in the blueprint. We said about 10 years ago, identify your lowest 20% achieving schools. Just identify them. And it was different for each district. It was not consistent. One district over here said, my schools are better than your schools, and I'm going to be identifying lowest 20%. And that's bad. And, I, and let me tell you, it, it, it is. And that's why I think we need to have a standard of what is a low achieving school. And if we're really going to focus on low achieving schools, Let's have accountability. If we can't have accountability for the other 85%, let's have at least accountability for the low achieving schools. But the, I think what we need to put our arms around is really saying how many are low achieving. We've said 5,000 are abysmal, and we can count those, but I guarantee you it's more than that. And it's not just Louisiana. Maybe we're the poster child for really where it's bad, but I don't think so. I think that there are are other states that have large numbers of kids who are failing in, in, in large numbers of schools, and if we're really gonna be focused on college and career readiness for the long term, there's got to be accountability for those schools. So my, my, my uh, further conversations with the department will be around, how are we gonna identify those low achieving schools? And are we going to focus attention on all of them are just the ones at the bottom. I think uh, also there, there is a, a, a proposal for flexibility and funding here. And, and I sure hope that that comes into being because our difficulty at the state and district and local level is 
We're, we're forced to follow a prescriptive route on the expenditure of dollars. And while we're being more creative about it, I think all of us are having to be more creative about it, when we finally do say we want to spend it like this and we go seek a waiver from the department, they can't give it. It's not because they don't want to. I believe that. It's because they can't. The law says they can't. So I think one of the big issues for us at the state level, <coughs> district level, and local level is partnering with the feds to get the flexibility. Now, that's going to be extremely difficult because in our conversations, they're basically telling me there's these constituencies that want money for homeless, and they don't want it to go anywhere else. And there's this constituency for rural, and they don't want it to go anywhere else. Well, somehow or another, we're going to have to come together. If we want the flexibility, and we're going to have to partner with the USDOE and seek the flexibility. The, the one other area, well, two other areas that I wanted to mention, and that is dropout prevention. You know, we, we are all, I think, in the United States in a panic over the number of kids who are dropping out. It's been raised to a very heightened level. And I would wonder if in the blueprint we ought to see a really focused and targeted effort around dropout prevention. Because we, we, we need to understand why it's happening. It's not an event, it's a process. And I think a lot more people, if they understood this process, could be more proactive to intervene, to keep those kids in school. Because if we don't keep them in school, we're not going to graduate them college and career ready. So I'm going to suggest to Carmel that, that we look at the, the development of that. And then finally, the, the only area where I really have a little fundamental disagreement is on choice. And, you know, uh, in the blueprint, there, there is no requirement for choice. And I think one of the real breakthroughs in No Child Left Behind was the provision of choice. Now listen, I'm not a traditional educator, so I speak heresy to the people out there who believe that, you know, uh, we're, this is going to destroy public education as we know it. Well, I fundamentally believe that if people have the right to go to a better school, that's, that's the right thing to do. And so my, my request, uh, I was taught, uh, make a request for change. My request for change is that we reconsider that as we go forward because you know, kids should not be locked into a dead-end school. It's not their fault. And I know, because I've heard the district superintendents of my state just complain bitterly over choice and having to grant choice because it hurts their ability to manage a school or their ability to manage budget and so on and so forth. And my answer to that is nuts, okay? Kids should have the right to go to a better school. Now, maybe if the feds don't require it, we'll still grant it in Louisiana. But I think that is a sufficient national priority that we should consider keeping that in the mix. Mike? Well, with that, <laughs> it's hard to follow Paul and Katie and Carmel. <laughs> And I think, uh, is this the la am I the last speaker of the last session? I think we might. We, anyone else want to go sit next to him? There's you one stand more chair. between them and the airport. Oh, my goodness. We're going to have a little dialogue. Jeez, so you, won't be the, you may not be the last speaker. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, invitation to, uh, to be here. Uh, I'm Mike Casserly, uh, in case you've forgotten the invitation or the uh, introduction uh, 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 long uh, ago. I'm uh, the executive director of the Council of the Great City Schools. I have to say before I uh, uh, start uh, how proud we are of our uh, relationship with Achieve uh, and also uh, how much uh, I am grateful for all of the good work that that organization and you have done um, over the years and particularly over the last uh, a year and a half. I think it's a, it's a major turning point uh, for us and it's a major turning point uh, for the organization. Uh, we're also uh, uh, proud of, uh, uh, of the Common Core Standards and and proud of our, uh, our modest role in it. I think we were probably uh, the first national membership uh, organization to actually come out and call for what was then called national um, uh, standards. And we even went so far at one point as to say that uh, if the states weren't going to develop these, uh, then um, the cities would step forward and uh, uh, do it instead. 
thank God you did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise, I would be just as tired looking as all of the folks on the, uh, on the Common Core writing team. Uh, at this point, um, uh, uh, we have uh, endorsed those uh, Common Core standards. We've had our uh, superintendent all sign a, a letter uh, backing uh, those uh, standards that got some uh, good national uh, attention, but we meant uh, uh, every word of it in, in terms of our enthusiasm for uh, raising uh, standards, and now we are at the process of beginning the hard work of uh, implementation. And one of those implementation issues, of course, is uh, the Elementary and Secondary uh, Education Act. I think uh, many of my remarks are, are going to be a little bit of an, of an amalgam of the three previous speakers, and in some ways, a little bit of a departure, uh, which some of you probably won't uh, find as a surprise. Uh, in general, um, uh, like uh, uh, some of the previous speakers, we are uh, very favorably uh, disposed to the administration's uh, uh, blueprint. Uh, we didn't endorse the blueprint, but uh, we hardly ever endorse anything, uh, <laughs> um, as many of you uh, know. There are places where we would probably go further than the administration and places where we think maybe the administration has uh, overreached or put into place uh, or proposed things that are not likely to, uh, to work uh, very well. But uh, that uh, said, we do use the blueprint as the foundation for our own recommendations and proposals for the reauthorization. Um, and if we didn't think favorably of the uh, framework that the department uh, built, uh, we would have proposed something vastly different. Uh, in general, you will find uh, the urban school districts, which are largely um, the subject of much uh, of uh, the federal involvement in education and much of the crux of where uh, the reform movement uh, is really focused. Uh, you'll find that uh, urban schools in general uh, are very uh, much in favor of retaining uh, the law's uh, emphasis on uh, academic achievement, its focus on achievement gaps and uh, disaggregated uh, data, um, and uh, a strong accountability uh, for results. Uh, we have uh, a lengthy set of uh, proposals that I won't uh, bore you with here, uh, many of which are consistent with uh, the proposals that uh, Carmel uh, uh, talked about. Uh, we do suggest replacing the current cascading set of sanctions with a series of sustained instructional interventions. Uh, we do, as the administration does, uh, put a heavy emphasis on chronically low-performing schools and differentiated uh, accountability. We would add more flexibility than the administration does uh, at the lowest uh, 5%. But in general, uh, conceptually, we are in the same place. Uh, we generally agree with the administration that uh, the number of schools that have been labeled uh, as failures has gotten to the point of being unmanageable and in some ways uh, meaningless. Uh, we would spend probably more time than uh, many have proposed uh, into simplifying and streamlining the legislation. There are some 580 uh, plus uh, mandates in the Title I law uh, alone, much less all of the other titles of the legislation, some of which are redundant and contradictory, uh, and we would uh, urge some streamlining of that process. We'd also, um, as uh, the other speakers have mentioned, put uh, a, a great deal more emphasis on value added and, uh, and growth measures to uh, determine progress. Um, we'd also spend a, a fair amount of time in the reauthorization on this issue, uh, and I know this is a, one close to Katie's heart, the disproportionate assignment of, uh, of teachers. I'm not sure that we would uh, solve that problem uh, through the comparability mechanism, but we are in favor of, uh, of addressing it. Uh, we do support, probably uh, uh, in a more aggressive fashion than the administration uh, does, uh, support for performance-based evaluations and incentives although we do have some reservations about the practical uh, dimensions of that. Uh, we'd also uh, completely overhaul uh, the definition of what an English language learner is and decouple it from uh, the definitions of limited English proficiency. And uh, we've gotten a great deal of positive feedback on that set of, uh, of proposals. Uh, there are, is some disagreement about it, but we've got a very detailed a set of recommendations on, uh, on that overhaul. Uh, we'd also uh, uh, retain uh, uh, much of the targeting uh, of resources in the legislation and agree with 
the Secretary's uh, comment this morning about putting uh, much more emphasis on highly effective teachers and moving away uh, from the highly qualified teachers that uh, uh, is in the legislation and we would devote uh, an enormous amount of new resources uh, to uh, research uh, and probably also overhaul uh, the after-school extended time and supplemental educational services part of uh, the law. We've got lots more uh, uh, other proposals and at the end of the day we'll kind of make up our own mind about whether the result of the process is worth our uh, endorsement uh, or not. Uh, but uh, we often surprise people uh, at the uh, end of the road. Uh, some of you may remember that uh, in 2002, the Council of the Great City Schools was actually the only one of the national education organizations, at least the only one that has a membership, uh, who actually came out uh, as House and Senate uh, uh, were debating final passage of the No Child Left Behind and supported uh, the legislation. And we thought it was uh, important uh, that uh, the nation's uh, primary coalition of urban school systems uh, endorse a piece of legislation that was understood, at least at the time, uh, as being about achievement, achievement gaps, and accountability for results. We never did back away from that endorsement. We never changed our minds about uh, that endorsement. Although I have to say, over the years, we certainly did learn lots about what worked and what did not work uh, in uh, No Child Left Behind. Uh, ultimately, I'd have to say, uh, as a reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, uh, it was a seminal a piece of, uh, of work and it certainly changed the equation for many students in urban school districts around uh, issues of uh, academic focus and disaggregation of results, the use of data and, uh, and accountability. Uh, some of you may or may not know this, but uh, since uh, 2002 uh, when NCLB was passed, the large central city uh, schools have now increased uh, their student achievement on the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, at faster rates, statistically significantly faster rates in reading and mathematics in both fourth and eighth grade than the nation at large. It's still not fast enough, uh, but uh, we are making a substantial headway on overall academic performance. The law did change our basic conversation about instruction and achievement and accountability, but also unfortunately I think the law uh, devolved into an exercise in compliance, uh, which uh, I think was largely based on the fact that the law was just too process oriented, which I think is a, a, a big lesson for the current administration in terms of how much detail to actually try to uh, prescribe uh, in the, uh, uh, the legislation. Uh, at this point, um, one of the things that I continue to be left frustrated by with uh, No Child Left Behind and Paul made uh, reference to it in exactly the way that I would hope uh, he would make reference to it, is that we are left with a great deal of uncertainty about um, the parallel issues of capacity building and accountability and which of those uh, two grand theories of thought uh, uh, are the best uh, drivers and mechanisms for uh, school reform or is it some mixture of uh, both. Uh, now here is where I think I'm probably going to depart uh, from the previous speakers and offer a little bit of a contrarian uh, perspective about the, uh, the reauthorization. My sense of this upcoming reauthorization is that uh, Congress really ought to spend a great deal of time and effort, uh, as is uh, suggested at least in part in the blueprint, uh, uh, in tilting towards uh, capacity building with an emphasis on the chronically low performing schools uh, and uh, pursuing academic uh, growth measures. And I say this in part because of the existence uh, of the Common Core in, I, in my belief that this reauthorization really ought to be thought of uh, a little bit like Paul has suggested it, and that is as a transitional uh, reauthorization um, that puts us in a good place uh, for the, the point in four or five years when uh, the, uh, uh, the Common Core are fully adopted. Uh, the assessments uh, that uh, the Secretary talked about uh, this morning are in place and uh, when we have more uh, capacity uh, built. Now, I do know that uh, having either an administration or Congress think of its work uh, in transitional terms is wholly uh, unsatisfying. Uh, everybody likes to uh, 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 to think of their work in grand uh, 
in, in grand gestures. Uh, but uh, I'd say this is my seventh reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in the last uh, 35 years. I understand grand gestures and uh, what, what they're worth uh, and what they're not. Um, but I think a reauthorization that presumes that all of the pieces of the current reforms that we've been talking about in this room are in place and then holds people accountable as if they were in place could do real damage. Um, and uh, to that extent, uh, I would put a less emphasis on accountability, not get, um, get rid of it, but soften up the, the way that Katie has described it and uh, do more transitional work, do more capacity building work to get us to a place where we can really make best use of the Common Core and the new standards that are uh, uh, being built. My sense uh, from uh, just m way too many years in uh, doing this is that Congress does not have the expertise uh, to calibrate all the pieces that will be in motion, uh, that all of us will be setting in motion and have set in motion uh, over the next uh, five years. Uh, and for that reason, I really think that uh, Congress ought to stay as far away from, uh, from the common core uh, as possible so they don't mess it up. Um, so Congress, as you probably know, has a very bad habit uh, of ignoring realities on the ground and in the states, ignoring research about what works and what doesn't work, uh, and uh, a very bad habit of accepting disparate and contradictory and too numerous ideas from various pressure groups, including my own, um, <laughs> uh, 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 in order to, uh, to buy a political uh, peace. They could certainly do a lot of things that would uh, simplify the legislation, remove many of the barriers um, that the legislation would now present to the uh, uh, easy uh, adoption and implementation of the Common Core standards. Uh, but uh, what I think they shouldn't uh, try to do is uh, either uh, preempt or appropriate uh, the Common uh, Core standards uh, in a way uh, that backs up the ownership uh, that have, has now been developed uh, in this uh, movement. Uh, now, I, having said all of this, I don't expect Congress or the administration to pay a whit of attention uh, to, uh, uh, to the advice uh, that I've given. Uh, but on the other hand, I uh, would hope uh, that they would be mindful of the fact uh, that we are going to be trying to implement the Common Core standards that we are so enthusiastically uh, in support of. We are going to try to be uh, uh, meeting the uh, requirements of the elementary, uh, a new elementary and secondary education law all at the time where, uh, when the, uh, the funding uh, cliff uh, for, the, um, uh, for all of our budgets is really starting to, uh, uh, to hurt much more uh, than it is uh, right now. This is a lot to handle at one time, and I think we ought not to, while we keep our sense of urgency about uh, reforming education, I think we also ought to ask Congress to think about this reauthorization uh, in a much more thoughtful, cohesive, and strategic uh, and long-term way than they've often done the reauthorizations before. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thanks to all four of you. I, that's a lot to chew on, uh, a lot of um, thoughts, a lot of provocative thoughts, some of them overlapping, some not, and we don't have a lot of time. Um, but I thought I would take a couple of the issues and maybe push a little harder and ask for you to very quickly help unpack it a little more and then I want to leave some time clearly for those of you who are interested to jump into the conversation, the dialogue as well. So one of the things that was pretty consistent and one of the things everybody knows in this room is that Common Core, Common Assessment, College and Career Ready, that is all about aiming higher. Um, and having higher standards, having more rigorous exams, having higher targets ultimately would mean fewer kids initially are meeting them, fewer schools. So I want to push on this issue of how to aim higher um, and have rigorous but reasonable targets and I want to push us right to whatever the new version of metrics like AYP would be. So back to where Katie at least put a straw man on the table of rather than going 100 percent by a certain year um, is there a way to do something very ambitious but, but more practical? Um, and what might that look like in each of your cases? To what extent is that something you're already thinking about in the blueprint? Um, anyone want to chime in on that and get a little more concrete? 
Um, I, I'd be interested in chiming in. I guess before I do, because it relates to my answer, I just want to clarify. Um, I, I think all of the things that they all said that was on the critical side were things that were points well taken and things for us to think about. I just so I'm not trying to be overly defensive here, but to Paul's point about no accountability in the middle, that is definitely not our intent. Our intent, I guess, we're, what we're trying to do is bridge your perspective with what Mike just said, because I think we're very conscious of what Mike just said, that, that um, we want to give maybe a little bit more flexibility in this period of transition and in order to make these higher standards more workable. Um, but, our, but just for the record, you know, our, our proposal is that every, that every school would be looking at performance targets based on subgroups, based on an overarching goal, whether it be 100% by 2012, 2020, 20 or Katie's idea, which is definitely worth considering. Um, so that, so, but the theory of action is that that would be developed by each state and we would review it and approve it, but you would tell us how you would differentiate outside of these two. You know, we want to create a federally driven reward structure and we want to drive a federally driven, if you are a chronic underperformer year after year after year, in some cases decades, there we're going to get more prescriptive at the federal level. Also, if you have chronic achievement gaps, we're going to get more prescriptive at the federal level. But for the schools in the middle to let states and localities have more um, say about what the, the, the interventions would be versus the cascading statutorily set, this is what's going to happen each year. Um, so I think that f we think that framework makes the, the performance targets more aggressive performance targets more workable. That said, I totally hear what, what Katie's saying. We want them to be performance targets that people feel are attainable because because then it'll be this, the entire system will be more real. So I think it, we would consider you know how to how to modify to get there. Okay. Yeah, I, let me just uh, uh, add on to that and I, I agree with um, uh, with what Carmel uh, just uh, described. I think in this reauthorization, I, and we're grappling with this in the same way that everybody else is grappling with it, uh, we're completely in favor of having as hard-nosed an accountability system as we can um, uh, articulate, uh, but not to do it in a way that uh, becomes counterproductive, particularly in a period where we're trying to implement something very unique uh, and, uh, uh, and diff uh, different. That suggests to me that um, we probably ought to rethink, at least in this reauthorization, the use of uh, status measures as part of the, uh, of the AYP system, in part because um, the status measures are tagged to the 100% uh, proficiency bar, but now we have two differing sets of proficiency levels, one defined by the Common Core Standards and uh, one defined by uh, the assessments that the states will continue to give during this, uh, this transitional period. Uh, you're going to have an enormous amount of confusion um, on the ground um, uh, and some counterproductive uh, behavior, I, I su uh, su uh, suspect, uh, if the status measures continue to be in place. But I think you can build uh, growth measures and do them aggressively um, uh, and differentiate them. Um, uh, in, in a way that keeps movement and keeps pressure on, uh, but uh, doesn't um, uh, stick with this 100% proficiency or anything kind of like it. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that's tricky about it, it's tricky in states that are already at the 90% level. So there, I think the, the tricky part is trying to figure out whether you can temporarily create an index, for example, where you'd have goals around, uh, around advanced performance as well. I think there are some cases where it's slightly trickier, but I, but, but I think most of the folks who are thinking about this really totally agree with your point that what, we're, what we need to be looking toward as a transition is some sort of improvement-oriented uh, goals, but in some cases those may need to be a mix of proficient and advanced, um, not just yeah. proficient. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah. And, and should well, this be, I sorry, go ahead, Paul. You know, I, I would still ask the question, okay, let's, let's say we modify it mm -hmm. along those lines, but what's the consequence for not meeting it? And uh, 
not that I want the federal government to prescribe the consequence, but that there should be a prescription to have a yeah, consequence. Totally, totally. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to suggest by my comments that, you know, the administration is not for accountability and, and repealing accountability, but, I, and I do understand there's a lot of pressure not to have this overwhelming consequence for schools, but there, there in my judgment, there needs to be one because if, if you look in Louisiana where we've been extremely aggressive at low achieving schools, we have taken over 8% of the schools in the state of Louisiana and put them in our recovery school district and we're making very good progress with those schools. But what happens is the people, if I set the bar at X, the people work to get over that bar and no farther. And I can put a goal on them and I have put goals on them, but there's no incentive, whether from reward or disincentive, whether from you know, a sanction, to get them to move up to where they need to be. Yeah. They just try to move above the bar. And yeah, I, so I, I, I think we've got to be mindful where the sanction may not be, it may not have to be quite as punitive as the way NCLB perhaps have set it out, but there's still has to be some kind of sanction there because I just don't see that human nature is such that they're going to respond. Yeah, yeah I, um, um, uh, I, I think that point is uh, well taken and I think the back and forth that we were just having earlier uh, didn't preclude sanctions. I think what we were talking about was uh, what to apply the sanctions or the incentives against. Um, and I don't think there's much disagreement that there ought to be consequences um, to, uh, the, to the failure to make growth however defined um, uh, and the like. Any opinion? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the one thing we're not acknowledging um, is, I mean, I think there's a consensus emerging around, yes, there have to be stretch goals, and yes, there have to be consequences, but probably the federal government shouldn't dictate all of those rather states <clears throat> states within some sort of framework should essentially make those decisions and propose them for federal approval. The tricky part here really comes in the politics of this and, and the, what the politics are likely to be uh, after the midterms. Um, I mean, it, there, while there's a lot of resistance in the field to ideas of choice, as Paul pointed out, there are a lot of people in Congress who feel very committed to that idea, and the same is true, interestingly, with subservices. Um, so it's, it's all well and good for us to say we don't think it should be quite so rigid. I think the political realities will make that a much more complicated conversation. Uh, just by the way, on the yeah. issue of, uh, of, of choice, um, we obviously have our own um, uh, thoughts about uh, the NCLB version of choice and other versions of choice. Um, but a lot of people often misunderstand the 1% uh, 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 provision in, uh, uh, in NCLB as uh, that being the only choice that is out there. Uh, if you look across the entire enrollment of the nation's urban uh, public school systems, about half of all of the kids who go to school in those districts go to a school outside of their neighborhood, half. Uh, which is a lot of choice actually going on, um, but uh, it's just not NCLP choice. Thank you. Can I uh, go to another issue that you had some emerging consensus, but maybe get a better handle on what specifically could be done? This is the all hammer, no help. Each of you said it differently, that current law is all hammer, no help. Then we need to build capacity building alongside uh, accountability. Um, there's even the rewards in addition to consequences. You package all that together, it's, um, there's some themes there, but are there, any, are there concrete ideas for how that could work um, that have already been put on the table or that should be put on the table? Particu you know, we had a good discussion here yesterday about what are folks most worried about moving forward in, in, in sustaining these reforms and implementing them, and clearly capacity is a big concern um, at every level. Uh, and, and, and having the wherewithal and the resources to implement uh, the things that they're trying to do uh, is a big concern. So what, 
what can and should the SEA do to help in that regard? So some of the things that we're thinking about on that front is within the accountability framework, providing additional funding at the state level in exchange for having more accountability at the state level. So we would judge states based on their track record in improving the performance of the schools and the districts within their jurisdiction and also identify them as low performing, high performing, um, but give them additional resources to build the capacity around school improvement efforts um, with the idea that if you're a low performing district, you would need to partner with a third party to use that funding. Um, so earned, and then, er, and also states would also be able to earn flexibility around uses of funds, as Paul was was describing. At the at the district level, one way we think we can build capacity for school improvement in the accountability framework is instead of dedicating 20% of Title I money to supplemental services in choice, which we strongly support, if districts choose to use their Title I money for those purposes, we would definitely support that. We have dedicated federal resources for public school choice, so we're very, very much in favor of public school choice, but feel like the better call in terms of if we're going to force districts to reserve a, a portion of their Title I money, we would rather see that money being used to build district level capacity for improvement and two areas and particularly that we want them to focus those funding streams on would be building human capital systems that will ensure that all schools in the district, not just the lowest performing schools, can deliver college and career ready curriculum and, and st on st standards. Um, and then the second would be on uh, targeted improvement efforts that fall outside of our dedicated school improvement dollars, which are primarily driven towards the bottom performing schools. So that's how we would propose having resources at the district level to build capacity, but then again, want to have a framework there where districts are also identified as high performing, and when they're high performing, be given um, response greater flexibility in their uses of funds, um, consideration in competitive grant programs, and then low performing districts should have consequences just like low performing schools have consequences in the form of changes of governance and, potential, and staffing just like we're calling for at the school level. Outside the accountability framework, we're looking to build capacity in some of the ways that I was describing in the presentation, increase investments in the uh, teaching, teachers and leaders, um, in, in investments in teacher preparation and investments in building curriculum and instructional supports that can deliver uh, on the college and career ready standards. So we have a billion dollars in our proposal for that last piece and call for um, the better part of a billion dollar increase in investments in teachers and leaders. Okay, so those of you who talked, wanted the capacity building, is, is this, does this sound about right? Yeah, it, it does uh, sound about right. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, when they think about capacity building, um, uh, typically think about the professional development. And there's lots of professional development uh, in Title I, both at 10 percent at the district level and 10 percent at the individual school level. And then there's uh, Title II, at least that part of it that's not used for, uh, for class size uh, reduction. One, one other, uh, but when I was referring to capacity earlier, I was uh, not only referring to the capacity of individual teachers to, um, uh, to translate the rigor of the Common Core uh, into their classroom, but uh, the capacity of uh, the districts to develop a curriculum that was uh, faithful to the, to the Common Core, uh, their ability to put in intervention systems uh, that were aligned with the Common Core, uh, uh, benchmark assessment systems, supplemental uh, materials, and the like. One thing that um, in the reauthorization that people might want to think about, and I just kind of thought of this as Carmel was uh, talking and I haven't thought it through a whole lot myself, is that uh, in Title I, um, uh, while there are school-wide uh, projects and you can use uh, the money in eligible schools uh, uh, for all kinds of, uh, of things, uh, what we might want to think about is in states where uh, the, the state has adop adopted the Common Core and districts have, oh, say 75 or 80 percent of their schools that are Title I eligible, that you could use your Title I money uh, for district-wide curriculum development efforts matched to the Common Core, intervention uh, d development and design, um, and um, uh, 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 supplementals uh, and other things 
uh, that you could apply not just to your Title I schools, but you could apply district-wide, uh, so the program wasn't quite so uh, siloed. Uh, and in that uh, respect, and you do it you know, for districts that had high numbers of, uh, of eligible schools, you could help uh, without spending a dime's worth of additional money, um, uh, uh, use your Title I money for capacity building exercises by simply kind of reconfiguring um, uh, the eligible uses. Thank you. Paul? Just yeah. one other comment. I, I think the idea of labeling districts and state agencies is a great idea. And uh, since we label schools, we might as well get labels too, right? We might learn better how to label schools if we are labeled ourselves. Um, but I, I, my, my biggest concern here is much like Title I just automatically goes to schools with very little accountability, I'm, I'm concerned about giving districts and states money if there's no accountability. Now, this is a new idea that the department has put on the table, and, and I think it's a great idea, but I do think we're going to have to work through it. I have a lot of districts in my state that, you know, if, if they just keep getting money, it'll just be a bigger central office and more of the same. So if we're going to do that, I think we have to be thoughtful about how we're going to do that and, and hold them accountable, which gets me to sort of a larger point, and that is a, the issue of competition for money. Now, you might think I wouldn't want to have competition anymore. <laughs> but. Um, We're getting along so well. <laughs> I actually, no, I actually think, uh, I think it's a good, a good idea, and I think we ought to use it more. Uh, obviously, you know, I might wish the outcomes would be different, but that's okay. But, you know, one of the things that we're doing in Louisiana is, and the department has granted us this ability, is to use our school improvement money in a competitive fashion. And what ends up happening is if you set the rules and set the requirements, uh, just like in Race to the Top, you might get a better shot at a quality product and people will get money for a quality product and then you can hold them accountable to those, th those ends. So I just want to throw a little one in there for the idea that making some of this money more competitive, whether it's for district capacity building or state capacity building, uh, would be a good thing. I, I just, the idea of just throwing money at everybody is, is just a little strange. <clears throat> Thank you. Paul, uh, we're running toward the end. I want to now encourage folks who want to get involved, ask a couple questions, make some comments to raise your hands. And we have some mics coming around because we have a few more minutes and I want to open it up. Paul? Okay. Paul Rebel from Massachusetts. Um, I, you know, I appreciate the discussion and the uh, kind of relentless focus on the schoolhouse and the standards, the assessments, the accountability aspect of this. You know, in Massachusetts, we've had high standards for a long time. We still have persistent achievement gaps in our our theory of action includes the capacity building that I think you quite rightly focused on. Uh, but it also includes some other dimensions that go beyond that, such as uh, delivering a healthy platform on which every child can come to school and be able to attend in the first place and be attentive. So in that regard, there were a number of things I didn't hear you talk about that I'd love to hear comments on. And I'll just give three examples here. Wraparound health and human services, the extent to which they uh, need to be part of this reauthorization. We take into account this still iron law correlation between poverty and educational achievement and attainment and the issues associated with poverty that often get in the way. Uh, secondly, early childhood education, about which there's such a powerful body of data. And I know in another silo you work on that, but I wonder if it isn't time to break down the silos. And lastly, though you touched on it in, in certain ways, this issue of SEA capacity. Uh, to do these things with respect to uh, building school and district capacity. Uh, our state education agencies, for the most part, are woefully um, undercapacitated, if you will, to do the kind of work. At least that was one of the, one of the conclusions that I draw from No Child Left Behind, is states didn't have the capacity to do the work in the first place. So any comments on any of those three, I'd appreciate. <laughs> so, um, First, on the wraparound services, we are definitely looking at that. It is a big piece of our blueprint. It, we have proposed uh, increased investment, about $2 billion, in a group of programs that are under the rubric of 
safe, healthy, and successful students. So that's where we're looking to invest in innovation around that. I think the idea that in the context of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, we're going to be able to fully fund the level of wraparound services that we need in our high poverty schools in America is just an unrealistic expectation. So with respect to those funding streams, what we're looking to do is to um, support innovation around how to do that well so that if we're investing in wraparound services, they're actually getting us good returns on that investment. And, and another big focus of those funding streams is how do we uh, take advantage of the billions of federal um, dollars before you even get to state dollars that exist for, for wraparound services already and how do we make sure that we create schools as centers of community so we're bringing in the services that already exist as opposed to trying to create new services. So that's sort of our theory of action in tackling that. We also feel like we're tackling it in that um, the accountability system is still largely would under our proposal be largely focused on academic outcomes but we're recognizing that we need to look beyond academic outcomes from a transparency standpoint but also in terms of an improvement efforts so um, we're investing right now with some of our existing funds on the development of school climate surveys and data systems that help uh, folks at the state and local level to focus beyond the academic outcomes to these other leading indicators around student success. So we think that will help build a culture where people are paying attention to those, those issues as well as the academic issues and seeing them as part of the, the whole system, that it's not a siloed approach but an integrated approach. It hurts me, hurts me, Paul, that you refer to our work on early childhood as siloed because I think we have worked very hard to ensure that everything we're doing in the early learning space is connected to everything that we're doing in the elementary and secondary education space. We Our, our vehicle for our big early learning initiative was actually a post-secondary bill. Actually, it was a health care bill. Um, and we, we gave it a shot and we failed, but it doesn't mean we're not going to keep going at it because we are a yes we can administration. Um, <laughs> so we're just, you know, we didn't look at it in a silo because we used a vehicle that was before us that generated the money we needed to do what we thought needed to be done in the early learning space. But the entire, the core of that proposal is alignment. So it's, that's what that proposal is about. It's not about slots. We've got lots of programs for slots. We proposed in our first budget as an administration a dedication of Title I money for preschool slots. Again, we fought and lost that battle. But this proposal, the Early Learning Challenge Fund, is not, it's not really about slots. It's about quality. It's about alignment with the K-12 system. So that at the same time, we are looking at the existing programs in the elementary and secondary education. Maybe, maybe that bill will become a vehicle for Early Learning Challenge Fund. We've got some money in the Senate appropriations bill right now to get Early Learning Challenge Fund launched. So we might not need ESCA as a vehicle. But whether, whether we, regardless of how we move the Early Learning Challenge Fund, we are taking a hard look at the elementary and secondary education programs and asking the question, how can they be levers to improve, drive improvements in the early learning, um, early childhood sphere. We've got a list of those that I can share with you. Mostly it's about how making sure as um, we're tackling things like standards and assessments that we're thinking about implications for kindergarten readiness in the early grades. Thrilled that one of the uh, winning um, applications is proposing to develop some assessments in the K-2 space. We see that as part of our early learning agenda. And then the third piece on SEA capacity. Oh, wait, you forgot that before you leave, you're going to bring Head Start back where it belongs, <laughs> right? No, no. Oh, I didn't say oh. that. I didn't say that. But <laughs> I, I, will, I will say, because I want to keep my job. We um, thought you said that. <laughs> we heard you it. Say that? <laughs> <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> So with respect to Head Start, though, one thing that we are doing is having unprecedented interagency collaboration around Head Start. When they put out their recent uh, program competition, we were involved in that process. That hasn't happened in the past. The Early Learning Challenge Fund would be jointly administered with us in HHS. So for now, that's how we are tackling <laughs> that issue. On SEA capacity, I guess I would just say one thing that I didn't mention before, which I think gets to Paul's point on that front is um, 
we, we, if we give money at the state level, one thing we would like to do is demand that that be matched by state funds. Too many states are virtually, we, we are the sole source contract for the, for the SEA, and that's just not right. There should be a partnership there. So that's one way we're going to try to get more bang for the increased funding that we're doing. And then there is also, a, a part of the blueprint is to have a national competitive funding stream around SEA capacity that could go to states, but it could also go to nonprofits working in collaboration with states to build their capacity. Um, although, so those are some of the things we're doing on capacity building at the SEA level and open to more ideas on that front. Thank you. Um, I know we're. First of all, I think we have a better slogan, um, yes we can versus just do it this morning. <laughs> you weren't here for that, but yeah. there was some discussion of slogans, um, <laughs> and which is more applicable. Yeah, could I throw uh, in a, 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 my two cents on this? Sure, we're, re we're, we're running out of time, but let's okay, I'll, I uh, see I'll, if there's any I'll other be, questions. Uh, real quick, this may surprise you, but I'm actually in favor of increasing state uh, capacity too, because uh, I have to say urban districts have been the victim of really bad state capacity. Um, and uh, we often cannot turn to the state for much help. Um, uh, Massachusetts is an, uh, in many ways an exception to that rule, but uh, <laughs> of course, uh, um, uh, but, uh, and uh, of course, Louisiana. <laughs> Good state. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, often when we go knocking for help on somebody's uh, door, there's just nobody home. Um, uh, but I would add to that increase in state capacity that we ought to also try to uh, increase local capacity uh, at the uh, same time for many of the same uh, uh, reasons. And I applaud your emphasis on uh, uh, wraparound services. I, I have to say, I typically don't mention it uh, myself because anytime I do, uh, somebody mistakes it for us simply whining that we haven't met the current standards because we didn't have X, Y, or Z. But you're absolutely right. Um, that those services are imperative. Okay, one final question, if there is one, and then we will wrap. Right here, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Gary Hochlander with uh, ConnectEd, uh, California Center for College and Career. Um, we all use the term college and career ready. It kind of just rolls off our tongues now. And it's not at all clear to me that we have, we, that we've really thought through what the career readiness aspect of this means. And I want to suggest that it would be very useful to take some time to figure that out uh, for at least, I think, three reasons. Number one, and I'm not talking about career and tech ed. I want to be real clear about that. Um, but particularly at the high school level, if students have the, the opportunity to organize their learning around an industry or a career theme, career becomes the way of connecting the math, the science, the English, the social studies, even the foreign language, in ways that are not happening in high school. Education is the only major industry that organizes the world around math, science, English language arts, foreign language. And it may make sense to us, but it doesn't make sense to young people. That's not the way their world functions. Um, and I think that number one, Career, and, and serious thinking about career, has the opportunity uh, to enable us, to enable young people to make meaning out of the academic knowledge and skill that we're asking them to master. Number two, a much clearer framework for thinking about career would make it much easier to articulate K-12, and particularly high school, with not only post-secondary, but also business and industry. Um, in so many of these meetings, post-secondary representation is mainly somebody from the Department of Mathematics. It's rare that at these meetings do we see representatives of higher education from schools of business, or architecture, or medicine, or nursing, or engineering. And I wonder how the nature of our discussions would change if we had a framework that allowed, that broadened the participation uh, of um, not only higher ed, but business and industry. And then thirdly, I think if we got serious about thinking about career, um, it might caution us 
against assuming that we can find single indicators of either college or career readiness. What you need to know and be able to do is very different um, if you are going into architecture as opposed to the performing arts or engineering as opposed to nursing. Um, and I worry a little bit that we're going down a path um, that leads us to the oversimplification of definitions of college and career readiness, and that career lens might help us protect from that outcome. So, my comment. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary, as always, Good. pushing our thinking in healthy ways. Um, we don't have a lot of time to unpack that because there was a lot wrapped up in there. And I don't know if there's anyone who wants to comment on it, but I think from our perspective, we've seen states struggle mightily with. Uh, college and career readiness, and a lot of them have really uh, figured out how to raise the standard in a meaningful way that, with the goal being, as was said earlier, post-secondary education opportunity for all and the importance of a credential. Um, but, you know, admittedly struggling with diversifying within that in some way that is still practical to implement. So I think there's, that's a, an area for future work, and I would hope that that future work could be pursued with um, with vigor without derailing uh, the real progress that states are already making on setting ambitious goals um, through the means available to them and continuing to pursue those goals. I think that's our kind of unified challenge, but thanks for pushing us. Um, so we are out of time. I want, I want to thank our panelists and please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, this is a lot to chew on. Um, and I'm sure each of them has their crystal ball for exactly how it's going to turn out and when, and they'll share that with you right after the session. Um, but it will, in the long run and in the short run, have a real <laughs> impact on all of your work. So we were glad we could provide some setting for our conversation. Um, this is also the end of um, the ADP meeting this year. Uh, again, we are really grateful that so many of you took so much time out of your busy schedules to come and be together and, and talk about these important issues. We were thrilled that there could be an important uh, announcement this morning about all of your work on common assessment. And we look forward to doing anything we can at Achieve to support that work, obviously, particularly in the PARC consortium. Um, but we're committed to helping ensure the ultimate success of this enterprise. A lot of really meaty issues unpacked. We're eager to help work with you on them in the period ahead. Katie, I know, has to catch a flight. So thank you, Katie. Um, she wasn't really just running out on us. Um, before we leave, just I know all of you know who do this kind of work, that there are people behind the scenes who make it possible. And I just want to thank a handful of Achieve people and ask, give them a quick round of applause. But I want to read to your names just so you know who they are. Um, Margaret Horn, who's in charge of the overall unit that does all this work. Um, and who we stole from Tennessee earlier this year. Sorry, guys. Um, Leslie Muldoon, who many of you know, who was really the coordinator for the meeting in general. Uh, there's, I'm just going to read the rest of the names. Clay, Kate Blasverin, who's in the room somewhere. She'll be running the next workshop we're having. Bonnie Verico in the back. Bonnie Verico, Dominique Wigglesworth, John McCurk, Callie Riley. These are just a few of the people who've invested a lot of time and energy in making this meeting possible. Obviously, it's an achieve-wide effort. We're a small organization, but we try to help uh, get a lot done in the states we work with. So um, just a real quick reminder, following this meeting, there's a workshop uh, for teams from many of your states to focus a little more seriously on sustainability, particularly looking through the election coming up. That is going on in one of the rooms next door, Edison EF. That will start at 3.15. Okay, we're going to give a little bit, bit of a break. We know it's been a long two days. Uh, we look forward to working with you in that session. Uh, Achieve staff, please assemble at 3 o'clock, if you will, so we can be ready. And once again, many, many thanks, safe travels, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.